the equilibrium constant. Okay, today we're going to focus our discussion on the equilibrium constant and some specific differences between equilibrium constant and some other values. So the equilibrium constant, K, it's determined experimentally, and so all the values are found in the lab when you see an equilibrium constant for an experiment. What happens is a chemist will analyze, he or she will analyze the equilibrium mixture and determine the concentrations of all the species in the reaction, all the reactants and all the products. The value for K for given depends on the specific temperature, and when you have that K value, it shows the degree to which the reactants are converted to products, or conversely, the way the degree to which the products are changed to reactants. The equilibrium constant, K. A couple things about it. Uh, first, I want to make a distinction between an equilibrium position and the equilibrium constant. Uh, first of all, an equilibrium position just means there are, there's a set of equilibrium concentrations. So what's the difference? Well, there's only one equilibrium constant at a specific temperature, but there's an infinite number of equilibrium positions. Let's look at an example. So here we have the reaction of nitrogen and hydrogen forming ammonia. We have three different experiments, and every single one of them ends up with the same value of K. Now, what's same here, and it's not stated, it's going to be at the same temperature, but in each one of these, we're starting with different initial conditions. So let's look at each experiment. So in the first experiment, we have only we only have nitrogen and hydrogen, so we have the only reactants. Those are allowed to react, and then at equilibrium, these are the three concentrations we have. When those concentrations are inserted into our K expression, the equilibrium constant is found to be 6.02 times 10 to the minus 2. So that's for the first experiment. So the equilibrium position would be the concentrations that were given. The equilibrium constant is what we see in the, in the last, last uh, column. So in experiment two, we've done the opposite. What we have here is all products, it's all ammonia, there's no nitrogen, there's no hydrogen. Well, the ammonia decomposes and forms nitrogen and hydrogen, and then here we have the concentrations of all the reactants and all the products at equilibrium. When those are inserted into our K expression, once again, we find that we have exactly the same value for K, 6.02 times 10 to the minus two. Then in our third experiment, we have a mixture. We have nitrogen, hydrogen, and ammonia, so you have reactants and products in this reaction, and they still react and form a different equilibrium concentration. So here we have the equilibrium concentration at the bottom. These three values are then inserted into the K expression, and yet again we have the value for the equilibrium constant. It's calculated, and it's exactly the same. So regardless of which set of equilibrium concentrations you're given, those will always give you the same value of K as long as the temperature is constant. Now, one thing to notice here, K is always independent of the initial concentration, but K is dependent on temperature. So a couple more things about K. K, big or small, where do we draw the line? Well, where we're gonna, where we're gonna draw the line is in number one. So let's look at this reaction of hydrogen and iodine, iodine forming hydrogen iodide. And so we have the K expression with hydrogen iodide in the numerator squared times hydrogen iodine in your denominator. So a big K we're going to define as any K value that's greater than 1. A small K just means any number that's smaller than 1. So what does a big K mean? A big K means there's more products. So for this reaction, there would be a greater amount or greater concentration of hydrogen iodide than there would be of the reactants hydrogen and iodine. Conversely, what is a small K? A small K means a lot of reactants. It doesn't go very far to the right. The reactants, which are on the left, predominate. And so and in this experiment, there would be a great amount of hydrogen iodide separately, but hydrogen iodide, the product, would be in a very small amount. So the first reaction with a big K proceeds to the right with a lot of products. The second example with a small K would, would stay at the left with mostly reactants. So finally, let's talk about the difference between a heterogeneous and a homogeneous equilibrium. To determine that, all you have to do is look at the state of the substances or states of the substances that are in the reaction. And if all the reactants and all the products are not in the same state, it's referred to as heterogeneous equilibrium. An example of that, if you take a mercury-2 oxide and it decomposes to form mercury and oxygen gas, notice this is definitely a heterogeneous equilibrium. We have a solid, we have a liquid, we have a gas. All three are different states. 
Similarly, let's look at one more example. This is an uh, example of calcium carbonate solid decomposing to form calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. Notice that once again, this is heterogeneous because we have more than one state. We have solid, solid, and then we have a, uh, the gas. So with the one state that's different, this is definitely a heterogeneous equilibrium. What is a homogeneous equilibrium? That just means all the reactants and all the products are the same state. And so we could refer back to the reaction we looked at earlier with hydrogen iodine gas forming hydrogen iodide gas. Notice there, every single reactant, every single product is the same state. They're all gas. So since they're all exactly the same state, we would say this is a homogeneous equilibrium. So finally, what we're going to do is do one example problem. For this, the reaction is gaseous phosphorus pentachloride decomposes to form chlorine gas and a gaseous product of phosphorus trichloride. So with that experiment, here's what was determined. The K was found to be 8.96 times 10 to the minus 2 at the specific temperature. Uh, the equilibrium concentration of PCL5 and PCL3, phosphorus pentachloride and phosphorus trichloride were found to be 6.70 times 10 to the minus 3 molar and 0.3 molar respectively. Calculate the concentration of Cl2. So the steps we'll go through. First, let's look at the reaction. And second, we want to write we want to write a K expression. That would be the concentration of phosphorus trichloride times the concentration of chlorine gas divided by the concentration of phosphorus pentachloride. Now what you we need to do is insert the three numbers we have and leave our unknown variable, which is a concentration of chlorine. So this is what we're looking for. We see here's our K constant. That would go in for K. Here we have the concentration of PCL5, and here we have the concentration of PCL3. So all those values should be inserted. Now you simply need to do the algebra, which means you'd multiply the 8.96 times 10 to the minus 2 by the 6.7 times 10 to the minus 3, and then divide by the 0.3, and that should give you the concentration of chlorine. The concentration of chlorine should be found at this point to be 2.00 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. That's it. I love chemistry. I love chemistry. I love chemistry.